Do you wish your code was cleaner and better written? It seems like a lot of people do because my last Noob vs Pro coding video was incredibly popular. So I'm going to take that same concept and look at two more examples of different types of code. I'm going to show you how a beginner would write it, how a more advanced developer would write it, and how a senior level developer would write this code. Let's get started now. With all of this new clean code that you're going to be writing, you're going to need a place to host your websites, which is perfect because today's sponsor, Atlantic.net, is going to be giving you an entire year-long free trial of their web hosting, which is an incredible deal. On top of that, you're going to get an additional $50 of credit if you use the code KYLE when you check out, and these servers they're giving you for free are incredibly powerful. They're more powerful than you're going to get at the free trials of any other hosting providers like DigitalOcean or Linode, so make sure you check out Atlantic.net hosting, linked down in the description below. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name's Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner, so if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Now to get started, I have here a really simple example of some asynchronous code. This first example I want to go over for these noob through advanced and pro is all going to be based on how to handle asynchronous code. Whether it's with promises, async await, or callbacks, there's a bunch of different ways, so I want to show you the best way to handle this versus some not so good ways. So first we're going to look at the more noobish junior level of code thinking, and this is how a lot of people, including myself, will write asynchronous code when you get started. So here, all this function does is it uses this read line command in Node, which allows us to type things into the console. So it's essentially asking a question, what is your name? And then it waits for us to type an answer in, and then it responds with that name we typed in. Same thing down here for job, and same thing down here for age. But something you'll notice about this is they're all nested inside of each other, which in this small example is not too big of a problem. But as your code starts to get more complex and you have more nesting, it becomes really hard to read and manage what's going on. You can imagine if you needed to ask seven questions, you would have seven levels of nesting. Or what if you had a bunch of code in between each of these different levels of nesting, which makes it just really hard to follow where you are in this nested hierarchy. So that's one major problem with this noobish version of the code. And that's probably the biggest thing that I would look to change in a more advanced version of this. Another slight problem that I see here is just the console.log. This could really use template literals to drastically clean up this code because it's a little bit difficult to parse exactly what's going on and making sure you have spaces in the correct spots between all of your different elements before the pluses and after the pluses. It's just a little bit difficult to handle. So I just want to run this program real quick to show you that it works. So let's just select that new version. It's going to ask, what is your name? I'll say, Kyle, what is your job? I am a developer. And how old are you? Let's just say 25. And it prints out, hello, Kyle, you're a 25 year old developer and then ends the program. So everything works as expected. And really this code's not too bad. You may see this code all over the place, but it can definitely be improved. So let's move on to the advanced version where we have a lot of improvements. The first major thing you're going to notice is that all of that nesting is essentially gone. We just have three equally leveled functions here with no nesting at all. And you may look at this code and think it's more complex and more difficult because it's longer than this new version code here. As you can see, we have quite a bit more code. But actually what we're doing is we're creating abstractions. We're taking all of this abstractions from ask question and moving it down here into this function called ask question. So that way, when we're actually going through our main function here of our code, we don't have to think about what ask question does. We just know we call it, we pass it the read line interface, which essentially is how we actually ask the question. It's how we tell the computer to wait for the response and we give it our question. And then it actually just does all the code it needs to do for us and it will return to us the actual name here. And the way that we're able to make this work in line so it looks like normal synchronous code without all of that nesting is by using async await. And we're also using promises. If you're not familiar with promises or async await, I have an entire video covering both. I'll link down in the description or the cards you can check out. But essentially what we're doing with this is we're taking this old non-promise based code, which is based around callbacks here, because it sends a function which it gets called when it finishes. And instead we're converting this to a promise. And that way we can use async await with our promises. 
So something you'll notice from a lot of higher level developers is that they'll take these old, you know, callback based functions and they'll convert them with a very simple wrapper that returns a promise instead of a callback, which allows you to use async await or just normal promise.then and .catch syntax in order to handle these types of situations. And overall, it just makes working with the code so much easier because we just have this really simple main function here. And the only reason I have this wrapped in a function called main is because with JavaScript, if you use await, it must be in an async function. So I had to wrap this in a main function. But we're just calling it right here. So it's essentially the same as not having the main function. Just in this instance, we need it to be wrapped in a function. So to make sure this works, let's just do the exact same thing. We'll call the advanced version, prints out what is your name, Kyle, job is developer, age 25, and you can see it works exactly the same as the previous example. You'll also know our console.log here is using template strings, which I think just makes it a little easier to work with. But something else you'll notice is that we have to always pass this read line interface into this ask question, and we always have to close this read line interface which is a little bit clunky because this ask question should be kind of self-contained, but we need to know what to pass into it. And we also need to know to make sure to close our read line interface when we're actually done asking our questions. So that is something that we need to manage on our own. And I don't really like having those extra dependencies and implementation details leaking out of our function. Also, you'll notice this ask question function is in the same file as our main function but they're completely separate. They should probably be in different files. So that's where the pro version comes in. It's going to clean up a lot of this code. If we open this up, you'll see that our code here looks similar, but a lot of our code is just not here anymore. It's been moved to its own file, which we're importing here. You'll notice this read line stuff. We don't have that anymore. There is no read line anywhere in this code. We don't actually care how we implement this implementation of asking a question. We just care that there's a function called ask question. We pass it a question. It'll get a user response and return it to us asynchronously. So that's what we do. We call that function three times in a row, and then we're logging out that output. And just to make sure that this works, just like everything else, we'll call the pro version. My name is Kyle, job is developer, and age here 25. And as you can see, it prints out just like before. So let's look really quickly at what this ask question file is doing. I just have it in this pro folder here. If we open this up, you can see we have our read line here and then a single function, which we're exporting down here, which contains all of our implementation details. We're creating that read line interface inside of here. We're also taking in that question and returning a new promise, which asks that question. It's going to return the answer to that question and also importantly, close out of our interface for us. That way, like in our advanced section here, we don't have to manage closing our interface on our own. That's implementation details leaking out of our ask question function. But with our pro version, all of that implementation on if it's read line interface, or maybe instead of read line interface, we're using some other library that does that for us instead. So we don't have to worry about handling that. We can change this to be some other library and it's not gonna affect any of our code out here. But in our advanced version, if we change this from read line to be some other library, we now have to change all of our code that calls ask question. And that's annoying, that's difficult. It makes it hard to change things in the future. But if we go to this pro version here, we don't have to manage that difficulty of changing things in the future because we just change it in one place here, this ask question file, and it's going to just work everywhere else that we used it. Also, you'll notice our asynchronous nature of doing this is exactly the same as the advanced version. The main thing I want to take away from this section for async code is that callbacks like this is bad. This is what's called callback hell when you just start nesting callback and callback and callback. And the best idea is to break this out into promises and use async await if applicable to actually manage those different dependencies and different asynchronous natures of your code. It just makes it easier to read when it's all like this instead of deeply nested inside of each other, potentially many, many levels deep. Now with the asynchronous code done, let's just close all those files. I wanna open up here the next section, which I called fat functions. And essentially what this is, is actually a comment that I got a lot on my last video of a suggestion, which is a lot of people create functions which are really, really big when they should really break them out into smaller discrete pieces. 
Also, their functions may do more things than they really lead on. And this noob version is a really good example of that. We have some really simple API code, which is going to update our user and create our user. And this code really doesn't do anything. It's just placeholder. It's just updating our user, creating our user. We're not actually saving it anywhere. So it's just kind of a placeholder API. Imagine there's an update and create user function. And then we have this save user function, which does a bunch of stuff. As you can see, it's a quite large function. And then all we're doing down here is we're taking a user with a username and a password, and we're calling that save user function. But something really interesting happens. You would think by calling save user, all we do is save the user. But really what this function is doing is it's doing validation for our user right here. It's also printing out all of our validation errors and it's saving the user. So this save use function, which is named save user is actually doing validation error printing, and it's doing saving. It's doing three different things, even though its name implies that it only does one thing. That is a big problem I see, and I like to call this essentially unintended side effects. This function called save user, it saves the user, that's good, that's correct, but it also has unintended side effects of both validating the user and printing out the errors that we get from our user validation. A great way to show this is if we call this, so we can just come down here, we want to call our new version, you can see we get printed out created user because we successfully created our user. But what happens if we don't pass in a username? This is going to fail our validation. So now when we call this, you can see it prints out username is required. So calling save user, we somehow printed out an error. That's probably not the intended behavior that you wanted when you called this function. So it's really important that you understand exactly what goes on in a function. So having all of these extra side effects is really bad for your function overall. And as you can see, we have really complex nested logic in here with a bunch of nested if else's. I kind of covered this in the last video. It's really not a good idea. As you can see down here again, more nested logic. We have our printing out for our errors. And then down here, this is some really important code. If the ID is null, we create the user. Otherwise we update them because if they have an ID, then that means they exist. So we want to update them. So really the big takeaway from this Nubus version here is that this function right here does way too much and it does more than it actually says it does. And it's really misleading when you're trying to use this code in the future. You may not always have the luxury of looking at the source code of save user because it's too big or just not something that you've worried about for multiple years. So when you call save user, you expect it to do one thing and only one thing. And when it does other things, that's when you can run into unintended bugs. So now let's jump over to this advanced version where we break out many of the different features of saving, validating, and so on. So as you can see here, our save use function, save user function is much smaller. All it does is check if the user ID is null and it creates the user, otherwise it updates the user. So that's really good. The save user function does one thing only and it does exactly what we expect with no side effects at all. Now the next thing we're going to have is our validate user function. And this just calls two helper functions for validating our username and validating our password, which both return an array of errors. So if we don't have a username, it's going to say username is required. And if the username length is too short, it's going to tell us that. Same exact thing for our password. This code is almost identical, but it's just checking the password and it has slightly different worded error messages. As you can see, password is required versus username is required. Then down here, what we're doing is we're getting our user we're validating them so we can get our errors. And then if we have any errors, so if our errors length is greater than zero, we're printing out our different errors. So let's test this version. We can just say here, we want to select the advanced version. And you can see when we don't pass a username or a password, it says username is required, password required, and the password must be eight or more characters. But if we pass in, for example, WDS and password, which is going to pass our validation and call that, you can see that we created the user. So the code works exactly the same as the new version, but the important thing is that we have all of our different logic broken out into functions that logically make sense. They only ever do one thing. Save user only saves the user, validate user only validates the user, and obviously these validation functions only validate the particular parameter that we actually want to check. But there's still some problems with this code that could be cleaned up in my opinion. Probably the biggest one is this validation is really repetitive. This required validation check is exactly the same between these two different properties. 
And same thing with this length validation. It's exactly the same. So we have a lot of duplicated code and you can imagine if user had 20 properties that all had different user required and character limit validations, it could be a ton and a ton of repeated code, especially if you have 10 different models all with 10 different fields. That's a hundred times you have to repeat this code. And that's a problem because if you need to change it in the future, you now have to change it in 100 different places. So in the pro version of this, what I want to do is take that validation logic and make it something that we can actually use all over the place without repeating ourselves, which is really important. Another important thing is that our validate function is a bit misleading. It's called validate user, but really what it does is get a list of all of our errors because we're returning an array of error messages instead of actually returning true or false for validation. So this validate user function, I think is slightly misleading because it returns an array of errors and you must know that array of errors is being returned and that if there are errors, then it's invalid. And if there's nothing in the error array, then it is valid. And that's an implementation detail that you need to understand in order to actually use this validate user function. And like I mentioned in the async function, I don't like it when implementation details leak out so that you need to understand those details in order to use the code. So let's jump over into the final section, which is our pro version, and take a look at what we have here. The first thing you'll notice is we broke our validation out into a new file. It's something that we want to have separate from our user and that can be reusable across our entire application. So we broke it out into its own individual file to manage all the validation in one place. Again, it's a perfect idea to break out your different logical components into their own files because it doesn't make sense to have your validation grouped in with your model, for example, when in reality, they're two different things. Now we also have our save user function, exactly the same as before. We didn't change any of that, but our validate user function is much, much different. It takes in the user just like before. And now we have particular validation rules set up. We're saying our username is required with a length of three or more, and our password is required with a length of eight or more. And then we're calling this validation messages function, which is coming from our validations here. And then we're returning an object. So remember how I said the implementation details where you need to know an empty array means valid and a non-empty array means invalid. Well, that logic I broke out here. So if we have an empty array, it returns true for valid. And if we have an actual array with errors, it returns false for valid. So that way implementation details do not leak out. Also our errors themselves are being returned so we can print them out later. Now let's go down here. We have our user with an ID of one username and a password. And you can see here, we're validating our user, which gives us a list of errors as well as true or false for valid. And if it is valid, we save the user. Otherwise, what we do is we print out those errors, which again is a function I put away inside of our validations because printing out the errors is something that the validation should handle because it's the one that created the errors and not the user. The user should not handle that logic. So we broke that out into its own file. And now if I run this section, you can see if we just do this, you can see username is required. Username must be three or more characters. It's being printed out. If we add in a username WDS, you should see that our user is updated because they have an ID, so we updated our user. So that, as you can see, has allowed us to drastically modify our code and break it out. And as you can see, all we're doing for our user is defining a single object, which essentially maps to how our parameters are required, what length they need to be, all of our different validations, and we pass that off to this validation class, essentially. So let's open up this pro folder with this validation here. And as you can see, we have a bunch of different functions in here. We have our printing of our errors, as well as validating for required and validating for length. And as you can see, it just has really simple checks. It's going to return a error message if the length is not satisfied. And if it required, it's going to return an error message if required is not valid. And then up here, this code itself is kind of complex and a little bit messy, but just kind of look past that. And essentially what we're doing is we're passing in our user object here and we're passing in our hash of validations, this hash right here of how we want to validate things. And all we're doing is looping through this. We're saying for our username, if it's required, check our required parameter. If there's a length, check the length requirement, same thing for password. And then we're constructing our error messages based off of that. So as you can see, our errors are like is required, must be three or more characters. And then when we print that out, we're just taking that property, which in our case is 
username, password, and all we're doing is adding our message onto the end of it. So it'll say username is required or password is required. And essentially all this is doing is just letting us take that complex logic that we have here in our advanced version, all of this repeated code that's you know, built into this big file here with all of our user stuff, it allows us to take all of that and completely remove it and put it in its own file. So that way, even if this code is complex, even if it's difficult to understand, it's completely abstracted away so that when you use this code, all you ever do is call validation messages or print errors. You don't have to worry about the implementation details of this complex function. You just know what it does. It's going to give you a list of errors and that is all you need to worry about or it's going to print out your errors to the screen for you. So the big takeaways from this section going from the Nubis version to the pro version is that number one, break up your big functions. If your functions start to get really big and do multiple things, especially if they do multiple things, break it out into individual functions that have a single responsibility. This actually follows the single responsibility principle. I'll link in the cards and description down below. I have a video on that. Secondly, if your code starts to get a bit complex where you're doing things such as repeated validation, like we did here, we have a bunch of repeated code, and you know for a fact that you're going to use this in other places, then you should break that out into its own file like we've done here. That way you can use it all over the place and you don't have to worry about copying that code every single place that you want to use it. You can just import this single file and it's going to be there ready for you to use it instead of having to recopy it and re-implement it every single time. And that's all it takes to go from a junior developer to a more senior developer when it comes to writing code. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out my other videos linked over here and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Thank you very much for watching and have a good day.